We continue with the scientific session. May I request Professor Stamberger to come on the stage for allergic fungal sinusitis versus eosinophilic fungal rhinosinusitis. Rather than talk about eosinophilic fungal rhinosinusitis and allergic fungal sinusitis, I've extended the topic a little bit for the simple reason to be provocative that there is zero, zero proof in world literature that something like allergic fungal sinusitis does exist. It is a misnomer, and that would be the end of my presentation. <laughs> the disease exists, we know it all. It's our problem series, those few percent that Professor Daniel Simon just mentioned about. But it's a wrong terminology. And to make that understood and to argue and to try to educate us all not to use it in cases when it's not indicated, I have to start a little bit further. And I would like to try to come up with an attempt at a correct nomenclature and classification of fungal disease. A statement, Jens Ponica loves to say fungus is among us. And of course it is, as you are sitting here and inhaling air, this air has a lot of fungal components, spores usually, many tens of thousands you inhale over the day, especially if there's air condition around, uh, as we all know. So you inhale fungi, they go through your nose, some of them are impacted on the nasal mucus, rest there for a couple of minutes, but then are transported to the nasopharynx, we swallow them, and this happens through all our life and is totally harmless. This is not a disease. This has nicely shown to be true for some of the driest areas in the world, like the Egyptian or the Libyan desert, where you find fungi, possibly less than here, but they all exist. So no wonder they are existent in our urban area of our little town of Graz in Austria. And if you had a very good mycologist who would take samples from your nasal mucus and who would know how to run a culture from the nasal mucus, which is not a simple task, they would be able to show that you have between two and three different species of fungi at any time in your nose that can be cultured. They don't cause problems. This is a standard feature in all of us. These fungi are on transit. When does that start, this contamination of our mucus, not mucosa, on the mucus? It was found that as soon as we start to breathe, as newborns and air goes through our nose, this contamination starts. Already a few days, two weeks after uh, birth, it was shown that the same amount of fungi as in adults can be found in newborn. So this is something we have during all of our life, but in 99.99% .99 of human beings, this does not cause any problems. Today we have much more sophisticated means of showing that our nose and with that immune system was in contact with fungi, be that PCR, etc. And I don't want to go in detail, I just want to support the first statement, fungus are among us and we are exposed to fungi every time, every hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, through all our life. This is not pathologic. So one of the consequences is that a culture from the nose or the sinuses, which has fungi grow, not necessarily is something that is pathologic. That makes it even more difficult. Not all diseases that have to do with fungi are sinusitis, despite in most classifications they are labeled as such. Normally, there's a variety of um, uh, classification attempts. This is what you read. Non-invasive forms, saprophytic ones, colonization, the various forms of fungus balls, allergic fungal sinusitis, which is clearly non-invasive, we believe may not be true at all. And then we have invasive forms and usually a fulminant 
acute form is separated from a chronic form. This is what, for instance, de Chazo in his classification called the granulomatous forms. Okay, some people can live with that. I did for a while, but I couldn't forever. The first thing I would suggest is that for the non-invasive forms, we add a group that is not called allergic fungal sinusitis for reasons I will get to very soon, but eosinophil-mediated forms. Because this is what differs those fungus-associated diseases from other fungal-associated diseases. These are really sinusitis and they present a reaction of our organism to fungi. Then, in that group of eosinophil-mediated ones, there is one group where the terminology is descriptive. Descriptive because this is what you always see. You find the eosinophilia in the mucus, in the slime, in the polyps, in the tissue, and you find chronic rhinosinusitis, hence EFRS. Allergic fungal sinusitis is a very, very special subgroup which most likely on this globe, if existing at all, is incredibly small, much smaller than the group of patients whom we see with this dramatic, problematic, eosinophilic, mediated chronic rhinosinusitis. So, no, it's not the end. There is another recommendation, and this we, from the West, owe to you, to your patients. None of the classifications takes account of those patients whom you are seeing with fungal forms between expansion, between eosinophilic polypoid changes, and possibly switching over into invasive forms. As a working nomenclature, let for those may use the terminology of transitional forms, and I will try to argument for that. Another statement for our publications and terminology. The patient was treated for intracranial fungal disease. Invasive means that you have fungal material in the tissue, a fungal problem that decalcifies bone elevates the dura possibly several centimeters or displaces the orbit by decalcifying the medial wall of the lamina papyracea is neither invasive nor is it truly intracranial. Very misleading nomenclature. We must be careful with our histopathologists when they come up with diagnosis. If somebody operates on a fungal ball takes an instrument and squeezes the fungal masses and happens to grasp a polypoid or edematous mucosa with it, he may squeeze the fungus into the tissue. If then the histopathologist sees this, he will describe this as invasive sinusitis, which of course was not the case. These are all the patients who are healed with antimycotic therapy. Why? Because there never was any indication for antimycotic therapy. Invasive means usually fungal hyphae are inside the tissue, be that the mucosa, connective fibrous tissue, bone, vasculature, etc. Next statement invasive forms from which you can die are not sinusitis. Would you call that sinusitis? This is the image I owe to Rodney Lusk from, from Omaha in Nebraska, United States, who deals a lot with uh, children. A mucor mycosis in an eight-year-old girl who died from that. She was ketoacidotic diabetic. Where the fungus had entered the sinuses somewhere through the nose, infiltrated the orbit, migrated through the orbit, from the orbit, through skull base into the brain where the child died from fungal specific complications. Is that a sinusitis? Not an appropriate terminology, I believe. Or for this, a patient from Graz, she was under 
uh, chemotherapy for a certain form of leukemia and developed again a mucor mycosis invasive and the origin was from the nose and or the sinuses. Is this sinusitis? What do we know? The fulminant diseases usually in uh, immune compromised patients after transplants, chemotherapy as you've just seen, diabetics are at high risk, especially when they are dehydrated and ketoacidotics and patients can die within hours sometimes and days, two weeks. Still today, mortality is around 25% of all the patients, despite all modern therapies that we do have. Most frequently mucor, but other, all kinds of species has been, have been described, more frequently aspergillus, etc. This needs aggressive medical antifungal therapy. In my early career, I still have learned we need aggressive surgery, debulking, etc., etc., almost following oncological criteria, but this has receded to some degree due to the higher uh, potential of antimycotic therapies, uh, liposomal amphotericin B, and combinations with several of the azoles, be that uh, voriconazole, caspofungi, etc., etc., etc. That's not the topic. There is a strange entity that we in uh, Europe and I guess in the United States rarely see, and it has always been labeled the chronic indolent cause of invasive disease. So fungus in the tissue. This is extremely prevalent if you follow the literature and colleagues um, at meetings in countries like Egypt, Sudan, the Arab Peninsula, the Gulf regions, and as I know from your literature and the talks with you, uh, Pakistan, uh, Sri Lanka, India, of course, etc. Well, the patients are said not to be immune compromised, not diabetics, no previous surgery. The cause is over months to years. Looks like a typical allergic fungal sinusitis. First expands, I push, and at some stage becomes invasive, and the patient may die from that. Whether this is the appropriate term remains to be open. One thing is clear, massive surgical clearing of the cavities, removal of all the fungal material, and aggressive medical therapy can cure those patients, but the medical therapy sometimes may be required for months, and as you all know, is extremely expensive, which should not be a limiting factor, but sadly, sometimes you find it. I've only seen a handful of these cases at home in my department. Here's one of these patients because normally the fungi we see lack the enzymes it requires to break an intact surface, be that a mucosa or be that skin. Think of an ear canal mycosis. This was one of these, uh, by the way, not indolent lesions where after work in the sphenoid a couple of months the patient came back with fungal infiltration of the pterygopalatine and infratemporal fossa. Revision surgery, massive antifungal therapy for many, many, many weeks, and this patient was cured. It is only invasive disease, to our present day's knowledge, that requires antifungal medication. There is no indication, there has not been any reliable effect, I'll come to the exceptions, for antifungal therapy for other fungal associated diseases. Saprophytic form, let's briefly rush through what we know on crusts in the nose. Symptoms, if any symptoms occur at all, are not fungus specific, but rather due to the problem on which the fungi grow. This is saprophytic disease. You will never find any hyphae in the mucosa. But be careful. Sometimes fungus can overgrow a carcinoma, like here an adenocarcinoma in a wood dust worker, or here in um, undifferentiated carcinoma of the epipharynx. So diagnosis is the clue. This is where we are challenged. We always should look underneath. Otherwise, removal of the fungal mass is the solution. There is no indication for any antifungal therapy up there. But we must rule out malignancies. Fungus balls per se are very clear, but this is where the confusion already gets larger. What is a fungus ball? 
A fungus ball is typically found in the maxillary sinus, but you can find it in each and every sinus and or cell. May have calcification-like rims in the center, sometimes dense as bone, as you can see it over here, crystallization cores, etc. You can find them about aberrant, around aberrant fungal, a tooth filling material up there. They can supersede uh, mucus seals. You can find them in the concha bellosa. And if you don't culture that in an appropriate fashion, you will never learn the therapy. Removal is a therapy of choice. The term aspergilloma does not come from the sinuses. It comes from the chest physicians, where in patients who had cavernous diseases like tuberculosis, you won't find fungus that would grow in such a pre-existing cavity, which then would be surrounded by some pus, cause some granulation in the tissue, but would not be invasive. So a pre-existing cavity filled by fungus. This is aspergilloma. A fungus in the tissue therefore can never be an aspergilloma. And aspergilloma is only correct terminology if the fungus consists of the aspergillus species. Otherwise, it's fungus ball called by bipolaris or you name it. In the sinuses, this is a frequent finding, constitutes about 10 to 12% of all surgical procedures we do at my department in our region. Uh, in Europe, and it varies from country to country. Hard, sometimes soft masses, you see some reaction, and the term aspergilloma here nicely fits. It's a fungus ball. You see some reaction of the mucosa, but it's not invasive. With this disease, you never need to remove any mucosa, be it as polypoid as it may be up there. This will recede to normal if you manage to completely remove the fungal material. No need for any antifungal therapy, be it irrigation, be it installation, whatever. If that comes back and is a fungus ball, the surgeon has, managed, has not managed to remove everything. Frequently you find in books, even dictionaries have it wrong. And sometimes uh, reviewers don't understand it even. The term mycetoma used synonymously with a fungus ball or an aspergilloma. This can never be the case. Anything in the lumen of a sinus of a cell never ever on this globe should be called mycetoma. But you even have it in textbooks. It is simply and straightforwardly wrong. Mycetoma is a, from soil dwelling dermataceous fungi, which usually are implanted by trauma, and the first description were on the plantar sole on the foot, madura foot. You should know that here. So traumatic implantation, which is rare in the sinuses. A true mycetoma would be if you perform a maxillary endoscopy for a fungus ball, retract your instrument or the trocar, and with that you implant some of the fungi adhering to the trocar in the soft tissue of the teak or the subcutaneous tissue of the upper lip. This then will cause an infiltration, mixed bacterial inflammation, painful long-standing granulomatous disease. This is a mycetoma, but anything inside a lumen can never be a mycetoma. Fungus ball is not an invasive entity, and it can never be a mycetoma. That should keep, be kept in mind. That's a typical aspect of a fungus ball in a maxillary sinus. I would strongly recommend that you do not perform uh, maxillary endoscopy uh, with a trocar through the canine fossa. Let's come to the main topic of our uh, discussion today. Allergic fungal sinusitis, and in a provocative way I've given a subtitle, is that a misnomer? Or is it reality? Don't get me wrong. The clinical entity that we see, usually patients, massive polyps, that glue like rubbery, muddy mucus, which you can stretch for almost half a meter, the high propensity for recurrence, frequently associated with lung problems, asthma that is, they constitute our true problem patient. That does exist. 
you find fungi in the mucus, never in the tissue, but in the mucus, in the slime. But do you find the allergy? Is it right to call this an allergic disease? There's our patient, and you all know them, and I do not need to go into uh, details. There have been previous publications, but the term allergic fungal sinusitis basically goes back to two publications, 81 Millard, published on a form of sinusitis that he called allergic aspergillus sinusitis, and this was first considered to be the sinonasal equivalent of allergic bronchopulmonary aspergillosis, which would have been a type 3 allergy, not a type 1. Katzenstein followed suit two years later, and as the, it was seen that there can be many different fungi involved, the term was coined allergic fungal sinusitis. Based on the criteria that Katzenstein proposed, masses of eosinophils in polyps, mucosa, and mucus. Interesting to read the early papers. I think hardly anybody does it. They did not have positive IgE parameters, not have positive allergy tests, but then the presence of eosinophils, especially masses of eosinophils, was considered synonymous with allergy. Like today, you frequently hear the patient suffered from or was operated for allergic polyposis. No word, no publication, no evidence, no proof in the world exists that any polyp can be triggered by allergy. Yet our histopathologists still see a polyp with eosinophils and they call it allergic polyposis. Nowhere there is evidence that an IgE-mediated allergy can cause a polyposis. We should keep that in mind when we are not so very careful with our burden. Okay, they suppose charcoaladen crystals, which we know is nothing but a degranulation product of eosinophils, and fungi in the mucus, non-invasive of course, and there should be an IgE-mediated allergy against the very fungi that was seen in culture or identified under the microscope. That has been forgotten very soon. It was taken if there's eosinophilia and if the patient has some form of elevated IgE or allergy that all fell together, allergic fungal sinusitis. So since more than 25, almost 30 years, we are carrying on with a term of which we do not know whether it's precise or right. You all know these criteria and this is well known. It's our problem patients here and sometimes you do surgery and you think you have a polyp and in fact you grasp one of these thick glue-like uh, material and this is the, constitutes the relatively small group that for instance Professor Simon has alluded to. It can decalcify the bone. It will not go through the uh, periorbit but it can indent it significantly and the same is true for the ethmoidal roof. An allergy which starts on one side? Oh yes, we can see that. At a later stage, it may move over and affect it all. Is that a typical behavior for an allergy? And we know the difficult and typical things, elevation of the dura, and if for the same patient in whom you know and see, the maxillary sinus is totally filled, you have an MRI and go to T2-weighted images, you see that the same maxillary sinus appears to be empty, it has a signal void. This is almost a proof for a fungus because this is due to the paramagnetic behavior of many of the substances there. What is the problem for us? Still many call these the diffuse polyposis, which is true, but it's not a precise definition either because this is the result of our surgery. Over all the decades, whatever we do, get much better if we involve post-op care and a better understanding. There are different regions where you find them and I've mentioned some of them and the criteria of allergy and fungi were very, very inconsistently met in publications but the eosinophilia is about the only component which is constantly identified. But again, we still use the term. Nobody doubts that there can be an immunological reaction to fungi and fungal fragments which are trapped in the mucus. The question, however, is, is that truly an IgE-mediated reaction 
or is it another reaction? We see this where in the mucus we have clusters of eosinophil around fungi. Did I say in the mucus? So the eosinophils are not in our body anymore. They are in the mucus. And they try, apparently, to destroy the fungi, which they consider immunogenic or aggressive. It's an image I borrowed from Jens Bonnikau, where you see eosinophils sitting on an alternaria fungus and dumping the highly toxic product, degranulation product, of major basic protein, which may destroy the fungus, but at the same time destroys the mucosa as well. Papers from the late 1980s already showed that when eosinophil granula degranulate and release major basic protein, this destroys the epithelium of the sinuses and, by the way, of the bronchi um, as well. This, however, is something that eosinophils only do, or let me put it the other way, never do in an allergic process where eosinophils, of course, are around as well. But in the eosinophilic fungal rhinosinusitis patients, you will constantly find major basic protein. So it looks, and there's now an uh, industrial set available for testing this, it looks like this could become the discriminating factor between the, uh, those diseases. We have tested patients with the bad disease that we used to call allergic fungal sinusitis, prist and rust, etc., etc., and we only showed a very, very small amount, which was uh, less than 10% where we could find eosinophilia, IgE-mediated allergy, against the very fungi that were found in the patient's mucus. So, Alone from this, you do not need to be a statistician to conclude that IgE, mediated allergy, cannot be a causative factor, let alone the only one for this kind of disease. Can therefore, if we believe that a type 1 allergy is defined by elevated specific IgE, can we then continue to call that disease allergic. As I mentioned initially, there is no proof in the world literature that this is the case. And the percentage of AFS patients who are truly allergic is not significantly higher than in atopics in general or in the non-sinusitis population. And if we accept that major basic proteins in a very specific degranulation product of eosinophils in the nasal mucus, but cannot be found in the mucus of patients with classic IgE allergic rhinitis, then major basic protein might well be something we identify in the future in the mucus and no regardless of the amount of polyps somebody may have or not have, and no, this is a patient suffering from the problem disease. This is a patient whom we should treat in addition or before surgery with corticosteroids, etc. So we have a systemic reaction of, the, of our immune system against a totally harmless intruder, the fungus, non-invasive. It's on its way through. We don't know why this happens, but apparently the problem is not the fungus, but our immune system. So if the descriptive terminology of these bad cases is eosinophilic, fungal, rhinosinusitis, following what you always see, eosinophils, fungi, rhinosinusitis, then we should conclude that the term of allergic fungal sinusitis should only be used anymore if we unmistakably can say that we have an eosinophilic fungal rhinosinusitis and we have an IgE-mediated allergy against those very fungi we can identify. This number is very small, but this does away with all these eosinophilic mucin fungi negative eosinophilic It is all the same clinical uh, entity. 
to accept allergy, be it for polyps, especially, however, for this disease as a major, let alone the causal factor of this disease, we do not have in the world literature a single proof. I hear some already, yeah, but the papers, Marple, Brent, etc., they have selected exactly this tiny group where you had eosinophilia, you had in the mucus, the fungus, and you had an IgE-mediated allergy against the very fungus. And they tried immunotherapy desensitization against the fungi, where the patients improved, like for hay fever desensitization. When this was stopped in the next series after four years, problems, however, came back, like sometimes in hay fever desensitization uh, as well. But even if we accept that allergy may be a coexisting factor, which doubtlessly makes disease treatment much more complex and difficult, we have no right to call that term allergic therapy. Wherever I travel, one of the first things those patients get is some form of antihistamine, some anti-allergic, which has no effect. Why? It's not an allergy. The cortisone those patients not only get but need, because they respond so well, treats other factors than IgE-mediated allergy as well, down-regulating IL-5, etc., etc., etc. So the recommendation is that let, until we have more evident data, both terms exist, but find another way of calling it to avoid the misleading impression that this disease is caused or has a significant allergic component. Call it eosinophilic fungal whatever, or eosinophilic chronic rhinosinusitis, et cetera, et cetera. And reserve the term of allergic fungal sinusitis for the tiny, minute group of people where you have all three factors really together. So eosinophilic fungal rhinosinusitis plus IgE-mediated allergy against the very same fungi, and not just some other allergy up there. So these are our patients, they are our problems. But if we take all into consideration, surgery, meticulous post-op care, washing, no antifungal therapy, this can be the result. Not only after five or 10 weeks, but after many years if we have compliant patients. Let me in the last two minutes go to the third problem. Every now and then you see that this eosinophilic fungal disease becomes bizarre, fills everything. Patients become propotic, may go blind from it, but just from pressure, not from invasion. It thins out all the walls of the sphenoid, and at some stage then, after having looked like a typical AFS, they become invasive. Rare to be seen by us, but these I've seen two or three cases here, where you can see it goes into the brainstem and causing an aspergillus meningitis, a very rare thing. Encasing the carotids, you have the glue there, very typical aspect. And, we, and these are pictures I owe to Dr. Bosrati from Cairo, where they have tons of these patients. They start like typical AFS, EFRS patients and present relatively late, and after a couple of um, months, if not treated properly, this then suddenly turns invasive, as you can see here in the coronal scan, and the patient dies from this disease. If this is a transient form, this requires to be studied, and possibly what we understand as a chronic disease may have a different cause with the same fungi in different country. We understand too little of that. So I think it's worth, worthwhile that a worldwide working group be established to bring some more light into this. But one thing is clear. The disease, our problem disease, is not allergic, as are polyps. So we should be consequent and start not to use the term allergic fungal sinusitis in a non-critical and non-specific way. Thank you very much.